So I'm going to tell you about Project Drawdown. Tra drawdown is the point at which concentrations of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere will peak and begin to decline back down to safe levels. And Project Drawdown is adding up the full range of climate solutions and the full benefit of all of the solutions and looking over the next 30 years to see if we can achieve drawdown in the next 30 years. And our preliminary results are looking pretty good. We don't know if it's going to be 30 years or not, but we can say that probably within the lifetime of some of the younger people in this room, we can achieve drawdown. So, good news. Um, so we see climate change as this kind of forcing function, which the other speakers have alluded to too, um, which helps us re-examine. It's a gift that is helping us re-examine the systems that humanity has, you know, somewhat been ill-conceived and, and unplanned and are very detrimental. Uh, it's an it's a opportunity to kind of re-examine those systems. And, uh, and I, I see a lot of opportunity when I see climate change. So I invite you all to kind of reframe the way you're looking at, at this issue. And one of the ways we talk about it is, is moving from this climate fatalism, or this kind of dark climate cloud that hangs over many of our heads, to a climate-inspired renaissance. All the solutions you see here and all the solutions I'm about to talk about not only solve climate change, not only move carbon from the air back into the soil or uh, help transform our energy economy, but also create stronger communities um, and create all sorts of other social returns on investment. So this is the list of solutions that my co-founder <coughs> Paul Hawken and I have been working on for the last two years. And he's right here in the front row, that's what we can um, And we've been collecting and honing and it's been a really fun project to just be always out there kind of with our ears perked looking for solutions. Um, and we've started a fellowship program, so we have uh, PhDs and postdocs from all over the world who are now researching and collecting data, the best available and newest data on all these solutions so that we can add up their benefits over the next 30 years and paint a different future, uh, specifically around climate change. So we're looking not only at the kind of typical technological solutions of energy and energy efficiency, um, though there's some really exciting ones in there. Uh, one of my favorites is LED lights. So 20% of our electricity globally is used for lighting, and LED lights is going to pretty much squash that to zero. LEDs are so, so far efficient uh, over what we're using now. And uh, our preliminary results, I wouldn't show this too far, are looking like it could be more impactful than solar, mm. which is amazing. Um, that's not a, a final result, but we are finding some really surprising things like that, where, where things that you wouldn't think uh, are that strong are actually more powerful than some of the kind of champion climate solutions that, that we've been pushing as a movement. So we have the technological solutions, then we have some social solutions that are really interesting, dematerializing our economy, sharing economy, uh, and also looking at boosting reproductive rights for women around the world. And there's some really great kind of cascading benefits that happen when you focus on reproductive rights. You know, when you boost a girl's education for every pr one year of primary school, she, her eventual wages will increase 10 to 20 percent. Uh -huh. And just think about what that does to her family and her community and her region and her nation and everything. Um, so each of these solutions can have those cascading benefits that, that just result in a much more beautiful world, like Rebecca said. So this is uh, the taxonomy that we're using. There's a lot of different ways to kind of slice up this pie and, and talk about these different solutions. What we've decided to do is, is organize it by what we call level of agency. And really to inspire people to, s to see that it's up to the individual, but not necessarily just at the household level. We all have decision-making power over a lot more than just what we do around the house. You know, obviously LED light bulbs are an important piece of the puzzle, but we have you know, decision-making power over our community over the businesses we work in or support, over the buildings we work in or you know, perhaps manage, and likewise with cities and utility and then finally land, you know, with the farms we support, with the food we eat, or with uh, the land that we manage, whether that's in our backyard or, or landscaping or, or farms. And so this is, this is our list and this is how we're presenting it. And it's really um, meant to be a project 
that, that helps people do. You know, you, you will see this information, you'll see what the different solutions add up to, and then you'll be able to t kind of take that next step and see that you have the power um, to, to change the world. So this is how we're going to amplify <coughs> our research. Um, we invite you all to join us. We'll have a global book. Um, Paul has a great readership that we'll be able to utilize for this uh, project and, and we'll publish in many languages around the world. There'll be an ebook as well. And then we'll have Drawdown Interactive, which will be a really fun platform where people can dive into the research that we've done and kind of make up new models uh, for the future for themselves and toggle the assumptions that we've made and, and learn about systems thinking in the process. And then the third piece is the Drawdown Database and API. So we're going to be super transparent and open with all of the data uh, we find and give it away to everyone uh, to ensure that what you're doing has the most kind of holistic and data-driven uh, research behind it that you want, um, and also inspire people to create new products and communication tools from it. So that's where our, our coalition comes in. We're building this really beautiful, diverse coalition uh, from people around the world, including people in this room. And uh, we're really looking forward to kind of spreading this new narrative. And um, yeah, I'm excited to take questions from the audience. Thanks. Great. <laughs> so I think we'll hold off on questions. And let me pose a, a couple questions to you folks, and then we'll take questions from the audience. But as you've heard, all three of them come to this whole notion of climate beneficial consumption from different levels of scale and different angles, from nourishing food to changing the textile industry to looking at climate-friendly um, solutions in terms of low carbon energy sources and bio sequestration and so on and so forth. And it's all scientifically based. And like in my agency, we tend to look at a lot of research and science. And so I'm going to ask you to kind of move from your head to your heart and talk a little bit. And I'll start with you um, in terms of what gives you hope in the work that you're doing. Mm. So much. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah, I feel very fortunate to be able to work in climate change and just have good news surrounding me all the time um, and be the bearer of good news to many people. Um, one solution in particular that I'm very passionate about that gives me a lot of hope is clean cook stoves. Oh. Um, and it's clean cook stoves, so they're improved cook stoves for two thirds of the world uh, right now cooks over an open fire. And um, the, the smoke that comes off of that fire is, is the equivalent of smoking about one or two packs of cigarettes a day for many women and children around the world. And uh, pneumonia is the leading cause of death for children around the world and that's largely due to um, this respiratory illness that comes from s inhaling smoke. And you know, um, my mom who's here is an anthropologist and has been working on cook stoves for a long time and as have many of her uh, colleagues. And now because of climate change, there's all this more focus on it. And there's just all these like really smart people figuring out how to finance it and how to just make it happen. Um, so seeing that kind of small industry blossom because of climate change has been, um, it gives me a lot of hope. It's just one kind of small example of the many solutions that are about to get a lot more attention. Wonderful. Thanks, Amanda. How about you, John? Uh, I'd say one thing that gives me a lot of hope is that as the millennial generation, um, and, uh, and if I look back at, at uh, you know, as a baby boomer, our, our generation, when I was in my 20s, as an environmentalist, there, there wasn't, uh, wasn't too many of, of, of my generation, uh, you know, focused on the environment. And, and today, um, there's so, mu so much awareness around these issues. And, and uh, um, you know they have access to uh, information through the through the web and and uh, so I'm I'm uh, optimistic that uh, this this generation and the generation coming uh, the, um, uh, before them um, will uh, will take take uh, their 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 opportunity to uh, change the course and and get us off this petrochemical industrial uh, track and and move us to a more nature uh, you know a smart technology path. you, Rebecca? What gives me hope is that so many of the solutions that we talk about in regenerative agriculture at this very moment, so yesterday I went and interviewed two women, um, middle-aged women, who were land-based. They both had farms in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and they're part of our fiber shed producer community. And I saw what they were doing on the land uh, in the face of drought. I'm doing drought interviews. 
Mm. And what I observed was this response to less water being coming from the sky. <laughs> and what they're doing right now is already trying to ameliorate some of the pressures, calling their flocks, looking at breeding very carefully. Um, they're not just importing feed. They don't have the money to do that. So they're changing how they, they graze. So by nature, things are becoming rotational and like strategically grazed. Um, there, there's no irrigation on some of these pastures anymore. I'm observing this response to already the early signs of, well, not early, I mean, we've been, depending on who you talk to, the signs of this climate situation have been present for some time. What I'm heartened to see is that under pressure, the first people under the pressure are the land-based people. Mm -hmm. And they're facing it first, and they have a very different story than those of us who work in offices or spend most of our times consuming versus producing. <laughs> So in that producer community, though, I still see this tenacity, this it's okay. I asked one producer, how long do you think the drought's going to last? Could last another 10 years. She said unflinchingly, as she's looking out on 95 acres of land, that you know, trees are dying and the grass is gone. And, and I'm just thinking to myself, she says that and she's not in tears. She's okay. Like, the thing is that we often create are the mental constructs around where we're headed, but the re when we're faced with the reality, we are strong, and we come up with solutions. And so what gives me hope is that we will find our inner resource to stay calm and to look at things. Um, and as you said so eloquently, getting back to a nature-based system, organizing around the carbon cycle as a fundamental principle for our economy and our material culture. And we get this great opportunity. And I think humans actually do have the resources to deal with this internally. And I'm seeing that come from the producer community. I'm like, oh, this is great. Thank you. Thank you, women on the land. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's think a little bit about the people here in the audience. And um, I'm just curious as to what action that you'd see that everyday folks like us can take that would be beneficial to the climate in our everyday lives. I'll start with you. Well, just from a fiber perspective, I would say take very, very good clo care of the clothes you own. Mm. Um, be dear with them. They are a an amazing amount of skill and labor and earth resource and carbon went into the production of that. So learn to mend, learn to over dye, learn to swap take the sharing economy approach to your clothing as much as you can. If you are so inclined to build skills and learn how to become a producer, whether you're a knitter, a sewer, take on the traditional skills, become a producer. Learn how to make, learn how to appreciate what it is to become a skill-based human again, if you have the ability to do so, because I think it retrains us into appreciation and connectivity for our material culture to make the things that we wear. And then the third piece I would say is if you have Maybe no time, no ability to retrain, but in, in clothing swaps aren't your thing, but you, have, you, you happen to have a lot of money. Buy from artisans. Mm -hmm. Buy things that are local. It's the first time in history where locally made things are the most expensive. You know, it used to be that only <laughs> very, very wealthy people could import things from overseas. <laughs> wow, so the reversal has occurred. So now those with wealth, please use every dollar that you have. Buy that hand-knit sweater. By that thing that you might go, whoa, because we're so attuned to thinking about costs because we've externalized all the costs in the fiber system. We're all paying dearly for them. So internalize those costs and buy that handmade piece. Mm -hmm. And I can guide you in many directions if you so choose. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. wonderful. Thank you. John, how about you? Just realize that we vote three times a day with what we buy and, and that the, the number one uh, cause of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the food system today is the, you know, uh, confined animal uh, feeding operations, CAFO, whether it's meat or milk. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, if you do eat meat or milk, um, you know, consider to eat less of it. And if you are uh, support, uh, you know, pasture-based uh, uh, animal systems, uh, and because that's going to make a, make a big difference. And then when you have the leftover food scraps or tea bags, <coughs> what do you do with it? Compost, mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and if you can't compost at your home, uh, 
uh, put it in a green bin that, that uh, your city has. And if your city doesn't have it, contact city council and encourage them to do that. So that's, that's really, really important. Compost is so important. Um, and become, the third thing is become uh, carbon literate. Uh, learn more about this. Uh, share with your friends and encourage everyone to come to the, to the September um, uh, 4th and 5th uh, Soil Not Oil Conference. Um, and there's a, a Miguel who's uh, here in the audience. Um, he was here a minute ago. Um, uh, he's, he has a booth uh, here on the table so you can uh, get more information uh, and, and come to that event and, sp and spread the word. Um, and uh, get, just get involved. It's, you know, it's important. It's like there's no more important thing that you can do yourself than just take, take some small steps and that'll make a, a big difference. And when did you say that conference is? September 4th and 5th uh, um, in, in Richmond, California at the, uh, at the Auto, uh, uh, Civic Center. And we'll have uh, some lot of great speakers uh, and it's gonna be a, um, a, it's also gonna be a global event. We'll have people from different continents coming as well. Oh, cool. That's very cool. Amanda? Yeah. So uh, Shauna Rappaport, a dear friend and board member of Project Drawdown and I have come up with an acronym which is the answer to your question. Um, and it's about getting a, in alignment with your climate values and it's spine. So this, these are the five things that you can do. Uh, spending, passion, investments, news, and employment. Mm -hmm. So spending, uh, we've spoken to, you know, you vote with your dollars every day and uh, speaking to the swapping economy. Uh, Yertl is a really neat new organization based in San Francisco that makes it really, really easy uh, to share your things. So that's Yertl, Y-E-R-D-L-E dot com. Um, and, you know, there's, there's lots to say on, on voting with your dollars and, and supporting the businesses that you believe in. Um, then passion. I think each of us have uh, some unique capability and some passion project that maybe has been sitting on the sidelines that has to do with, with kind of getting our, our self in alignment uh, with our climate values. So kind of spark that up and, and find a buddy to, to help you make that happen. And then I for investment. You know, there's a big divestment movement happening right now, but I think the investment movement is just as important. There's some really neat... Uh, regenerative agriculture and clean energy projects that we could all be putting more money into, even if it's just a little bit. Um, and something we spoke about when we were getting ready for this call is, is not only divesting from fossil fuels, but divesting from the conventional ag uh, companies that you know none of us <laughs> want our money sitting in their accounts. Um, and if you have a bank account with a larger bank, the likelihood is your money is not sitting in a vault somewhere, but rushing around the world and um, probably making things like the tar sands happen. So mm -hmm. think about where your, your bank is. Then news, speaking of consumption, the media that we consume every day uh, helps us kind of understand the world. And if you're reading what I'm reading, there's be no, no reason to be uh, pessimistic. There's so many good news stories that come across my desk every day. Um, and one of my favorite sources for those uh, is Grist. And even if you are reading that, I encourage <coughs> you to read it even more. There's some really good long form um, articles on there. And then if you want to go deeper in the climate world, there's an organization um, called Tree, the Tree for Climate Communicators, and that's treealerts.org. Um, mm -hmm. I recommend their, their email list. And then finally, employment. So you spend 80,000 hours in your life working. Um, how can you make those more, more impactful and, and making a world that you want to leave for, for yourself, really, in 10 years? I mean, this is all happening. It's not even about like, the world that we're leaving for our children anymore. It's the world that we're going to live in um, in, a, in the coming decades. So spend those 80,000 hours either in the job that you're doing now or, or shifting or thinking about you know, an encore career uh, doing something that you're really passionate in. That's spine. Great, love it. Getting yeah. your spine in alignment. Great. Well, I let me open that. it up to That's all of great. you. So <laughs> questions, comments, if you have a practical suggestion of what people in here can do or want to comment on what gives you hope, that's cool too. We'll start here. Yeah, 
Uh, so solar cookers are one of the many clean or improved cook stoves. Um, there's other ones that um, use smaller sticks and produce biochar. There's other ones that use the same fuel that people are already using but produce less smoke. Um, so there's a whole array of many different types of improved and clean cook stoves. Uh, what's best, it depends on the context. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So the solar ones wouldn't work with some cultures where people want to cook at a particular time of day, you know, and, and maybe the biochar ones wouldn't work because charcoal is considered as something else in that culture. So it really depends on, on the context. But there's, there's a beautiful diversity uh, in, the, in the industry of cook stoves. Um, and, and you can buy, you know, carbon offsets if you're into that, uh, that help promote these, these projects. There's a really cool uh, biochar cook stove project down in Costa Rica uh, that I can recommend people. Yeah, okay. Yes, Gretchen. Yes, um, the answer is definitely yes, and we have some great uh, partners in our coalition that'll help us make that happen. And I love to, to kind of see that reflection when I talk to people about the project. I'm like, oh, well, the investment community is gonna love this. You're basically you know, making this report that usually cost $8,000 per industry, and you're doing it for 100 different industries, and you're giving it away. So it depends on you know, what people's contexts are. But yes, um, we're talking to PBS. They do these things called Nova Labs. Um, where they put together mm. citizen science and gaming and, and data um, to make um, science really accessible to youth. So that's one of the, our coalition partners that we'll be working with on the youth side. But if you have other ideas. I'm, I'm I have another idea, the Center for Eco-Literacy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes please. I'm in schools every week talking Excellent. to kids who are often mm. feeling pretty hopeless, yeah. um, mainly because they don't have a lot of control over it. They see our generation as kind of controlling things and they're sort of ready for us to move aside mm -hmm. and let them take over because like you said, they've been learning this, you know, mm. since they were children. So cerebrally or c intellectually, they understand the issue. But anyway, we would love to partner yes. with any of you at any time, so. Yes.
question. We get to do lots of things. And yes, we have the time to do it. Yeah. It sounds like it sounds like you're a system thinker, which is a bittersweet thing. I often say because you don't know where to s end the boundaries. Or yeah. <laughs> Yes, over here. Yeah, glad to glad to mention that. Uh, good good question. Uh, one one thing is in industrial hemp uh, is a great rotation crop, um, whether it's corn or soybeans or wheat or cotton. Um, so it, it reduces the, the the weed pressure, so it reduces the need for pesticides and herbicides. Um, uh, secondly, one of the the most exciting uh, products from the uh, from the hemp fiber. Uh, is for uh, building houses, and they make something called hempcrete. Most people in America aren't familiar with it, um, but in Europe they built thousands of homes there, and they built a few in North Carolina. And it's basically uh, making a short the short fibers from hemp or the herds, which is about 70% of the stock, and you blend it with um, a lime, and you make a plaster, and and uh, you can essentially grow you can grow the fiber and build your house uh, next to your farm where you grow it. And uh, it replaces, uh, it's uh, basically non-load bearing walls, so replaces insulation, um, um, you know, Tyvek, um, um, and a lot of times they'll be maybe like eight to 10 inches thick, and it's a very excellent insulation, um, and, it, it it, and if it's done correctly, it can, it can uh, basically start absorbing carbon, you know, uh, into the walls. Um, and we have the potential, and also you can use it for remodeling. So we could be remodeling, you know, millions of homes. And so uh, hemp has been, there's gonna be 500 acres of hemp grown in Kentucky this year, um, uh, and, and a few other, few other states. Uh, it's not legal for commercial complete yet, but um, uh, it's for research purposes. But the governor and uh, the folks in Kentucky are saying, well, we need to research what the commercial you know, potential is. So they're gonna grow 500 acres, and, and Nativa's proud we're gonna introduce the uh, first organic uh, uh, grown, you know, hemp oil or, or uh, uh, hemp seeds uh, this fall there. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so that's got a got a real, really a great way because uh, fiber, the insulation from fiberglass is very energy intensive, and some people say that actually. And when I was 19 years old, I used to sell uh, insulation door to door, so I was part of the problem. You know, <laughs> I thought, hey, this is good; it's energy efficiency. You know, but they say it takes more energy to produce that, the, the make the fiber insulation. Uh, you know from uh, high temperatures than, than it will be in the, the building for the, you know, the 30 or 40, 50 years, et cetera. So it totally eliminates the need for that. Um, and ironically, it's the crop that has potentially could change construction more in America is illegal. Mm -hmm. So go, go figure that. Um, you know, part of the, my meta-analysis, the part of the challenge we're facing is, is we're disconnected from nature from when we were born and, and our parents were and our great grandparents has been on for, for multiple generations and people need to get connected more to nature and, and nature has a lot of, lot of potential solution and, and hemp is, is one of the you know, tens of thousands of plants. I mean, 90% of the diet that we eat uh, comes from, from 12 plants, the majority of people, 12 or 14 plants, that's it. Um, uh, well, you know, there's tomatoes and potatoes and corn and soy and, and wheat and um, uh, you know bananas and, and there's there's d um, milk and chi uh, chicken beef um, you know there's just there's just uh, canola you know there's there's a bunch more plants that we can we can use and we need to, to learn more about that and the other thing I just wanted to share is the the Bay Area we're so into this technology you know systems and 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 social media and chips and all these things they're all these young folks who are onto this and, and also the older generation, so they're so into this technology. 
and they think that, that a computer chip is the highest form of technology or some app, and they don't understand that a tree is an amazing technology, mm -hmm. but somehow mm -hmm. that's natural, so we forget about that, you know. And, and uh, so hopefully we can, we can start to change that, that, that viewpoint. Yeah. Yes. Can I say right. something about hemp? Absolutely. You good? Rebecca? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so in form of the, the hemp question as it relates to textiles, uh, so 75% of the cotton in the United States is genetically engineered and less than 1% is organic. And this year we struggled with getting California cotton farmers who were going to grow organic mm -hmm. to even be able to plant a non-GMO species. They felt so stricken by the pressures of the drought and the labor costs that were going to go up if they did do an organic crop. They, we lost a lot of acreage to GMO this year in California. Um, so last year when hemp did become legal um, in the terms of research for Kentucky, but the full on species cannabis sativa became legal in Colorado, um, we did uh, an acre uh, in Southern Colorado for textile grade fiber. So Compulti and Futura 75 were strains that I worked with. And I hired all local people in a Pueblo Hispanic community to raise it. The second poorest agricultural community in the world, well, this country, I should mm -hmm. say. <laughs> and they grew, um, you know, they had their trial with growing at 8,000 feet elevation, but they did this beautiful plot and we've decorticated it using a garage scale inventor, which we've separated the fiber out. Um, I've gone through now two new technologies that have just come on board this year using compressed CO2 to soften the hemp. And then another, um, another group in um, Canada has also used this catalyzer that they can retrieve from very low water use. And what we've done is we've, I have samples now of hemp that feels it's 100 times stronger than the cotton. Our tensile mm -hmm. strength um, tests are being done by Clemson University right now. But we can now get the hemp to a point where we don't have any to, to add any capital investments to textile manufacturing equipment that exists. We can run the hemp through cotton systems and wool systems, we believe by the end of this year, to at least create um, you know, a blend of, uh, to start supplanting the use of cotton. And um, I'd say in Kentucky this year, what's really exciting is the mountaintop removal sites so areas where there is almost no topsoil left, um, we are doing an experiment um, with a company there and two farmers who've taken five acres where there's no topsoil and they're putting um, compost and then biochar down and they're going to do direct seeding, right, of the hemp seed into it. And we're going to mm. do strength tests and um, micron tests and, and see what comes out of that for fiber. So um, there's a lot of potential, and I think in the textile industry, we're going to really need to move away from cotton. <laughs> Very few places where cotton really will persist, I think. Uh, and there's, and I'm a big proponent of a few cotton farmers I love dearly, but I just think we're going to need to transition to bast fibers, nettle, flax, hemp, um, some of the Swiss technologies around using um, pulp from invasive plant species. Mm. Um, there's a lot to do and a lot to grow here. Um, for textiles, I love hemp. It's just an incredible crop. Amazing. We have time for one more question or comment. Yes. Anybody? I could take it. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to see the, this shift um, towards seeing climate as this opportunity. And, and really, I think the green jobs movement was a little ahead of itself. Like it, there weren't enough green jobs to really show that didn't have the traction there. So it kind of fell a little bit. But I think now there's enough climate solutions, traction, 
Uh, people are seeing the impacts of climate solutions and it's just kind of ready to just take this and, and seize the opportunity. So I'd love, there's enough to debate about in terms of like which solutions to implement and where to put the money. Uh, and I think we're moving into that debate instead of the, is it true, I'm not a scientist debate. Um, so I'm really excited to see kind of the, you know, getting into soil carbon and getting into these, you know, different ways of, of looking at climate change and beyond just clean energy, um, which I think has been, you know, a, a smart um, start to talking about climate solutions. There's a lot of very obvious, you know, economic um, uh, benefits from, from renewable energy, but now there's going to be more diversity in there in, in talking about the various solutions. So I'm excited about that. John, and I, I would say that, <coughs> you know, if, if we end up having a, a, a Bush and a Clinton for a choice, you know, which is, gonna, which is a, a sad, uh, sad reflection on, on the, our, our uh, situation, I mean, essentially both of their agricultural policies are going to be virtually identical. And, and those of us who have been involved in uh, the Department of Agriculture, and it's almost like, you know, Obama's has been worse than, than, than Bush. Um, uh, in terms of, of of agricultural policy, so you know you're not going to see a lot. I think I think I think the um, I think Hillary is going to really going to get hit hard about her support for Monsanto, and you know she's been on on record saying that that we need to call it a different name and talk about how it's going to conserve water and drought tolerant seeds and things. You know at the the biotechnology conference in San Diego, she's there. So um, I mean, so there's uh, un unfortunately uh, it's it's a it's. It's not a not a major, you know, positive two choices. So, uh, as I think people are going to realize that they need to work on a lot of other things. That one of my friends on Facebook had an interesting post. He said, um, he says, I guess I'm going to vote for Hillary, um, but certainly don't don't remind me or I don't want to talk about it. Um, I'm I'm done with that now. And and somebody kind of ranted. He says, well, he says that may be true, um, but there's four Supreme Court justices might be being appointed, you know, in the future. That was that was his view. Um, so it's a it's, it's a tough tough situation, uh, but ultimately we need to to, to do what we can uh, ourselves and realize that that you know presidential politics those are they're not necessarily who's running the situation they're just they're 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 kind of actors who are there to uh, to to do the bidding of, of other forces and 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 where are those forces they make money based on 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 us consumers so if we change our our, our business uh, models. Um, then, then they're not going to, you know, Monsanto should be should be going bankrupt the next 10 years based on 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 disinvesting their stock and based on not buying, uh, you know, companies' products such as General Mills or Kraft that, that that support Monsanto technology. So, it's really the reason why we have this is because as a culture we support the companies that that pay them to to be the president. It's not as plain as simple as that. Um, but that means we got to take responsibility uh, for what we're. Our own action and, and our community's action. So, thanks, John, Rebecca. Yeah. There you go. Uh, I would just say, for presidential politics, I, I concur with what John was saying. A lot of these, the, the backing for the, these um, for these candidates is coming from who we're investing in, culturally speaking. So. That's a really important strategy is your daily investment as related to spine. Uh, the other piece is the TPP where you do have a presidential kind of where they can ramrod things through. I think that trade policies, um, Clinton, I don't think is going to be that much different. Um, but, you know, Obama did print a uh, future for a bioeconomy. The blueprint for a bioeconomy came out of his administration, which is all about synthetic biology and genetic engineering. So I think one place for you know, they're talking about the populist fringe or Elizabeth Warren-esque politics influencing Hillary. And I would say one of the places for the populist movement to focus on would be the agricultural aspect of populism. So what does that represent? Looking back to our roots, how did farmers and agrarians in the past push on FDR? How have we pushed mm -hmm. on the Democratic Party as a, a people who care about producing things? And how does that group galvanize and push? Um, so... I think we have a chance, but I think you're right. We really need to push on this particular sector of the Democratic Party. How are they relating to synthetic biology, genetic engineering, um, and, and agriculture as a whole? Big place for a lot of progress to occur. <laughs> <laughs>